What the sword is to the knight, the wand or staff is to the wizard. As a lever, the sword amplifies the strength of its wielder, and the same can be said of a magic wand. Depending on the myth, the wand is a necessary element for casting spells, or a way to make a wizard's inherent magical power even stronger. Magic wands, and their larger counterparts such as rods, scepters, and staffs, are found in pretty much any story or game that features spellcasters. From fairy godmothers to Gandalf to Harry Potter, from Dungeons and Dragons to Wizard 101 to Elden Ring, magical sticks of one form or another can be found in the hands of nearly every wizard, witch, sorcerer, warlock, necromancer, shaman, enchantress, well, you get the idea. They're everywhere. But why is that? Why do seemingly humble pieces of wood inspire such power fantasies? There are a number of theories as to why magic wands and the like became so prevalent in our culture, and in this video I'll take a look at a few of them, as well as some of the most influential literature about the topic. And just in case you stumbled upon this video by accident while searching for something else entirely, no, I won't be covering the magic wand sex toy. That's a totally different type of fantasy. If you've ever seen 2001 A Space Odyssey, you might remember the scene where an ape uses a bone to club another ape to death. Could a scene like this have played out in prehistoric times? It's clear that, at some point, one of our ancestors was the first to pick up an item like a bone or a branch and use it to whack something or someone, realizing that it magnified their strength. On some level, could that have been the origin of the myth behind magic wands? A long, hard implement that grants its wielder power? Imagine a swordsman waving his weapon around in an intimidating fashion and making his foes cower from his skillful display. Maybe, long before swords, some primitive human did that with his stick, and his enemies, knowing what would happen if they were struck by it, also shirked from his presence, almost as if they'd been affected by a magic spell. That legacy of power has been carried on to the present day in the form of regalia for royal families which often include a rod or staff. Now, we're not expecting the king or queen of the UK to bash anyone over the head with their jeweled scepter, or to use it to hurl down a fireball. Cool as that would be. But another link I've heard of that connects staffs with power involves the humble shepherd's crook. Well, nowadays we think of shepherds as humble, but back in the day a large herd required a lot of land, and with land came wealth and power, which may have transitioned into some form of rulership. At the very least, the shepherd uses his staff to guide his herd, granting him a kind of lordship or power over them. And maybe because old men tended to be in positions of power, and elderly folks sometimes needed a staff or cane to help them get around, that would have been another way that pieces of wood became associated with power, and one of the reasons we tend to think of wizards as elderly men. Mm -hmm. oh. You would not part an old man from his walking stick. But enough speculation. What kind of hard evidence is there to indicate that magic wands have been with us for a while? A cave painting dating back 18,000 years in the caves of Lascaux in France depicts a man lying next to a bison and a bird-headed staff. Some speculate that the man is a shaman performing some kind of ritual related to the slain bison or a rhinoceros depicted nearby. In somewhat more recent times, tombs in Egypt dating to the second millennium BC have been found to contain apotropaic wands, which were made from the ivory tusks of hippopotami and used to ward off evil. These curved wands were sometimes richly inscribed and appear to have been used in birth rituals where they protected both mother and child. Egyptian pharaohs were often depicted as holding a staff or wand as well, sometimes with a curved head reminiscent of the aforementioned shepherd's crook. The barsum was a bundle of sticks or rods used by Zoroastrian priests during the rituals dating back 3,000 years. A similar implement was used by ancient Roman fire priests and by Hindu priests in antiquity, although whether the barsum was held in the hand like you'd expect for a wand, or placed on a stand during the ceremony varies based upon the religion. One ancient Greek spell states that a caster should hold a, quote, branch of laurel in the right hand and an ebony staff in the left to invoke a spirit and reverse the hands to dismiss it. And several Viking graves containing the remains of women have also been found to contain staffs, suggesting that they were seers. So it's clear that magic wands and staffs have a long history, but that's just one of the ways which they've influenced modern thinking on the subject. Magic wands and staffs have also featured prominently in literary sources, particularly one book that features a famous orphan who performs powerful magic with his wand. And no, I'm not talking about Harry Potter. The Bible's most famous magic staff comes from the Book of Exodus. 
When he confronts the burning bush, Moses' staff, or rod in some translations, is turned into a snake and back again by God, who commands Moses to Take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. And Moses took his wife and his sons, and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Moses and his brother Aaron used the rod of God on several occasions, to call down plagues upon Egypt, to make water spring from a stone, to lead the Israelites to victory in battle, and, most famously, to part the Red Sea. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground throughout the midst of the sea. But Moses isn't the only biblical figure to use a magic wand. Even J.C. himself gets in on the act. Early Christian art from the 3rd and 4th centuries depicts Jesus using a magic wand to perform miracles such as raising Lazarus from the dead or turning water into wine. Religious professor Lee M. Jefferson thinks that this representation in early Christian art was an attempt to link Jesus with Moses and the miracles the latter performed with his rod to make Jesus seem more legitimate via his association with the better established Moses. Sometimes this association was literal, since images of the two were occasionally found next to each other in Roman catacombs. Seeing Jesus raising the dead established him as more powerful than any god or goddess, Jefferson says, while also reinforcing faith in the afterlife. Shifting to classic mythology, the rod or staff of Asclepius was born by the deity of healing and medicine, and should be familiar to most people as a symbol of medicine used by entities such as the World Health Organization and the United States Air Force Medical Service. It has one serpent twisting around a staff, but is often conflated with the caduceus, which features two serpents coiled around a winged staff. Instead of medicine, its classical symbolism is related to commerce, which, considering the cost of medical care in the U.S. these days, might actually be more appropriate. Moving on to more secular sources, in Homer's Odyssey, the goddess Athena uses her magic staff to turn Odysseus into an old man and then make him young again and the enchantress Circe uses a wand to turn Odysseus's men into pigs as they enjoyed her feast. These are considered the first mentions of magic wands or staffs in literature. In his book Science of the Magical, author Matt Kaplan theorizes that the wand used by Circe at her feast might trace its origins to another wooden implement associated with food, cooking spoon. Moving ahead a few millennia, the Oathbound Book of Honorius dates to the 13th or 14th century and contains all manner of useful information for would-be wizards. It gives very detailed instructions on how to create your own magic wand or staff, which should be made of hazel or laurel wood, and should have four sides. On one side should be written Adone, on the second side Seboeth, on the third Hiskirios, on the fourth Emmanuel. On the middle of the wand, make the pentagon figure of Solomon, and where the wand is held, a cross, and thus it will be prepared for sacred and wonderful works. It's notable that the book, associated with Pope Honorius I, sees the wand as an implement for carrying out sacred and wonderful works, and not the kind of pagan witchcraft wands would later be associated with. Another medieval manuscript, the Key of Solomon, also gives instructions for creating a wand, recommending hazelwood, while the staff needs to be made from elderwood or cane ash. The wood needs to be cut from the tree in a single stroke on the day of Mercury at sunrise, and again have words carved upon them. Like the instructions for the wand from Honorius, God is again invoked to grant the item its power. An English version of the Key of Solomon inspired Gerald Gardner, called the father of modern witchcraft, though not without controversy, to incorporate the wand into his brand of Wicca. In his Book of Shadows, the wand can be made from any material and is used to summon certain spirits who are afraid of iron and steel. Nowadays you can find magic wands for sale on Etsy, Amazon, and elsewhere, and their makers probably didn't follow the instructions laid out in any medieval manuscript. After all, they didn't have plastic or mass production back then. Still, whether you believe in wizards or not, these thin, intricately carved sticks have been with us since the dawn of civilization, and will continue to influence scholars and writers and game designers for a very long time. Maybe that's a bit of magic on its own. So the next time you see a wizard wave his wand around to cast a spell, Think about the long and storied history of that tool and what got it to the form we think of as familiar and traditional today, and where it will take us in the future. Thank you so much for watching this video. As always, give it a thumbs up if you liked it, and subscribe if you want to see more content exploring the true history of fantasy. Feel free to leave a comment letting me know if there's a topic you'd like me to explore in more detail in a future video, and I'll see you next time.